Hi, everyone, and welcome to our question and answer session. We would like to thank our presenting sponsors, Ipsum Pharmaceuticals and Sun Pharma. And we would also like to thank our other conference sponsors, including Novartis, Advanced Accelerator Applications, and Lexicon. Just a reminder that there is virtual exhibit rooms that you can visit if you scroll down the page on our website and click the link to join. Um, again, all the questions came through Slido. That's www.slido.com. Enter the event code LACNES. Um, I'd like to first introduce my co-moderator, who many of you already know, Josh Mailman. Josh was diagnosed with um, NET of the pancreas in 2007 and is an internationally recognized advocate for NET patients, as well as an advocate for integrative oncology and nuclear medicine and molecular imaging. He serves on multiple boards and committees, uh, including NETRF, NANETS, SNNMI, to name just a few, and Josh is also the president of NorCal Carcinet. Today, Josh and I are moderating a question and answer session with this incredible pa panel of NET experts from across the country. All of our speakers are very active in national NET organizations such as, as ASCO, NANETS, the Healing NET Foundations, um, and they're active in NET research, and of course, they see and treat NET patients. So we're very grateful to have you join us today. It's an honor again to introduce our speakers for today. We have Dr. David Metz from University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Alexander Ganji from Cedar sinai in Los Angeles, Dr. Michael Sudlin from University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Robert Ramirez from Oshner in Louisiana, Dr. Eric Mitra joining us from Oregon Health Sciences, Dr. Run Yu from UCLA, Dr. Andrew Hendafar from Cedar sinai Dr. Dan Lee from City of Hope, and again, my name is Lisa Yen from Black Nets. Um, so we're gonna break the panelists down into two groups. And the first group will take some of the questions um, and then we'll go into the second group. So um, we're going to start first with Dr. Dan Lee, Dr. Hendafar, Dr. Robert Ramirez, and Dr. Ganji. And my question for Dr. Ramirez um, is, well, since we're talking in the time of COVID, we'd like to know, um, are those of us with carcinoid tumors or dip neck especially considered high risk for COVID. Thanks, Lisa, and uh, thanks, Josh, and uh, the rest of the organizers uh, for, for this fabulous meeting. Um, it's uh, been really a treat to be able to, to be here today. Um, so, so certainly COVID has changed the way uh, we operate nowadays. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and it's, we're really, you know, we're, we're, this is one of these situations where we're learning more and more about this disease every day. So, it's not, you know, clear-cut answers, and the answers that we think we know they change over time. So, um, so, 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 are are you at risk for uh, or at higher risk than the general population that doesn't have this? Is a question I get many times, and I think I think in some cases you are, in some cases maybe not. Uh, certainly, patients who are on on active treatment, especially myelosuppressive treatment, uh, either chemotherapy or PRRT. Um, certainly can be at, uh, at a higher risk and, and, and not just a higher risk. It's just, uh, um, the, one of the big things I worry about is, is if you are on this myelosuppressive treatment, you're probably at a higher risk of, of developing severe complications. Uh, and certainly in my patient population with already compromised lung function that, you know, I, I get very concerned about that. So. So I think, uh, you know, whatever we can do to try to minimize those risks, uh, you know, with, with the C following those CDC guidelines and instituting therapy at the appropriate time um, is what we need to do. Thank you for answering that, Dr. Ramirez, and that's helpful. Um, I think COVID's on the mind and especially when it comes to treatment. And I know um, Dr. Mitra already addressed some of this regarding PRT, but Dr. Lee, I'd like to ask um, what patients could do to assess whether starting treatment like PRT or any treatment in general during COVID, um, should they wait wait six to 12 months or how would you go about advising them? 
I think that's a great question. And like what Dr. Ramirez highlighted on, I think it's a balance in terms of what the risks and benefits are. I think very early when COVID hit, um, you know, throughout the world, uh, the, the general consensus was trying to not go after uh, as much as uh, in terms of aggressive based uh, treatments as possible and, and try to delay and push back procedures and whatnot. Um, but I think what we quickly realized is that, you know, COVID's here to stay. It, it's going to be a, a part of our life for a long, prolonged period of time, probably. Um, and as a result of that, I think now the emphasis has started to shift nationally in terms of, you know, cancer patients ultimately will require treatment and they need to get the best treatment possible at that time period uh, because you don't know whether or not someone's going to come down with COVID or not, just like anything else. And now cancer centers are reestablishing in terms of rather than necessarily delaying treatment, but putting the precautionary measures in place so that it's actually safe and preventing the patient from contracting COVID as much as possible while they're getting treated at the center. Um, so I think really we're, we're at a, a, a time point where we're starting to transition that role. Um, and I think, you know, for uh, many of us, we have to really think about really providing the best possible treatment for the patient like we would otherwise uh, and really think about that because it's not just going to be, you know, three or six months. So I wouldn't personally try to push back uh, a treatment I would recommend otherwise uh, at this time. Mm -hmm. Very well said. We're all trying to find a new normal. And I know, Dr. Ganji, this is applicable for you, um, and especially us being in Los Angeles with um, a high number of COVID cases. So the question for you, Dr. Ganji, would be, are surgeries being performed right now during COVID crisis? And if so, what qualifies or what are the parameters to have surgery? Sure. Um, certainly in Los Angeles, surgeries were being performed, and I think they, they kind of have throughout the, uh, the duration of the COVID crisis based on uh, specific criteria. There's uh, numerous various criteria that come out, have come out from different um, surgical organizations uh, and then disease-specific organizations. With respect to neuroendocrine tumors, certainly patients who are symptomatic, if you, know, you have a bleeding small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, an obstructive symptom, or a functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, those patients were never really delayed for surgery as long as hospital capacity allowed for surgery to happen. Obviously in Los Angeles, it, our hospital capacity was always a little bit better than it was in New York. And so we didn't have as many limitations um, that way. Um, certainly if patients have tumors that have, you know, uh, are not responsive to different therapies or have short doubling times, um, that hasn't prevented us from moving forward with going to surgery. Um, certainly if we're, you know, considering metastatectomies or things of that variety in patients who are fairly stable, and this is just part of the treatment algorithm, those cases were the ones that were typically uh, delayed or pushed back just because um, some neuroendocrine tumors, as we know, most of them are actually fairly slow growing. Uh, and so until we knew um, basically the, the functionality of the hospitals um, and our capacity to take care of patients, some of those operations were delayed. Uh, currently, uh, you know, across the board, I do believe that there's appropriate methods in place to keep our patients uh, safe, whether surgery be performed at Cedar sinai or elsewhere. Uh, there's specific criteria and testing criteria. So all patients before they have surgery, at least here, need to have COVID testing and test negative within 48 hours. Um, alternatively, you get treatment. So um, those are those are essentially, there, there's no real qualification um, to get to surgery, but surgery first needs to be the right thing for the patient. And then secondarily, you just wanna make sure that there's appropriate safety precautions implemented at the institution. Thanks for clarifying, Dr. Ganji. And, and speaking of protocols, um, for surgery, do all net patients need to have the octreotide protocol? So certainly patients who we know um, have carcinoid um, syndrome, those patients are the ones that we're typically more concerned. Um, we do not routinely uh, have the octreotide protocol for all patients. Um, here, but every institution is a little bit different. Uh, typically for those patients who are symptomatic, we do have a creatide available. We may start running it um, preoperatively as a drip. Certainly if we have increased concerns, we have uh, additional drugs available. It's a discussion that we have with anesthesia beforehand. In patients who are typically asymptomatic or don't have widespread metastatic disease, it's not, uh, we don't routinely use that. Um, Okay, thanks for that. That comes up quite frequently. I'm sure you get that a lot too. Um, one, another question that comes up, Dr. Ganji, is about the risk of liver abscesses with subsequent liver resections after a previous Whipple 
um, and especially and or liver resection surgeries. Um, so there, there is a known uh, association with uh, risk of liver abscess um, with, you know, transarterial chemo embolization and things of that variety after you've had a Whipple procedure. Um, and if you had tuned in, we, we kind of redo your plumbing after the Whipple. And um, when that happens and the, the bile duct is restricted, it's basically reconnected to a piece of the intestine. Um, and so because of that, there's really um, no effective boundary between the intestine and the biliary tree. And so you can have some of the contents of the intestine that may have bacteria float back up into the biliary tree. And by virtue of that, the sterility of the biliary system is decreased. And that's why there's an increased risk of abscesses. And that could be greater than 50%. Um, depending on what literature you read, I mean, sometimes it's upwards of 80% depending on the treatment type. So that's just a precaution that we need to take. And there have been patients who have had significant complications and subsequently require, you know, open surgery and, and hepatic resections because of um, the complications from the liver abscesses. Um, less, less frequently, um, we see liver abscesses after resection for the same reason, but typically it's with embolization and the res because there's dead tissue. Um, and so the dead tissue sits there and the, the gastric contents basically float into the biliary system. Okay. Um, and another question that comes up is in the presence of healthy gallbladder, and since only about a third of patients get stones from SSAs, semestan analogs, why is the resection of gallbladders done during surgery? So typically the, the historic teaching and the thought was that if we're going in there for a different operation and you have a, you know, 30% risk, let's say, of developing gallstones uh, in the future, um, to remove the gallbladder because there's really no significant downside of not having your gallbladder. I think at worst, about 2% of the population gets diarrhea when eating really, really fatty foods after uh, col cholecystectomy or gallbladder removal. Um, so typically it's to save you from a, an operation if you fall into that 30%. Usually this is a discussion I have with patients and I do have some patients that are very attached to their gallbladder and for whatever reason don't want it removed. So, so in this, those situations, unless we clearly see stones or a problem or they've had previous symptoms, we will leave it in place with the understanding that at some point they may require a second operation to have that dealt with. Mm -hmm. uh, the thought is just one and done essentially. Yeah. Well, speaking of multiple operations, if someone had a partial Whipple or some sort of resection for gastronoma, how many times might they expect to have um, surgery before having to have a full Whipple? Um, so just like uh, liver surgery, essentially the same paradigm really fits into, into pancreas surgery now, especially with the ability to do enucleations and wedge resections. Um, a lot of that depends on anatomically where the lesion is located and the size. Um, so sometimes in the pancreas, if these, you know, you can have a tiny, tiny lesion that's sitting immediately on the pancreatic duct in the head of the pancreas. And if you try to enucleate that, you're going to have a, a, a world of complications with a chronic pancreatic leak and ultimately end up in surgery. So um, anatomy is really of critical importance. If all of your lesions are, are peripheral, um, we continue to do as many enucleations as we can to preserve the pancreatic parenchyma essentially um, before having to do the operation. So um, if, the, if a minimal approach is feasible, then that can happen as often as it needs to. Um, but at some point it may not be just because of the remnant amount of pancreas you have and where the tumor may be located. Thank you for all of those helpful answers. Um, and speaking of, you know, just follow up after surgery, Dr. Ramirez, um, someone's wondering if a net specialist is needed for follow-up um, surveillance following a right middle lobe lobectomy. Um, specifically, um, this question is specifically for a three centimeter typical nets with a KI67 less than 1% with negative lymph nodes. So, so do you necessarily need to see a net specialist? Uh, not necessarily, but I think you need someone to follow you. We, I, I, we know these things can sometimes come back. Uh, and, and the wrong thing to do is say you're, you're cured and you never need any further surveillance. Uh, so I see that quite a bit. And uh, um, so, so yeah, do, do you need to travel to see a net specialist every year for a scan? Not necessarily, but someone needs to be keeping an eye on you. Okay. And a, a follow-up question that Dr. Ramirez is what it would be the definition of progression-free survival and how often would you recommend scans to get measurements of patient's progression? So, so definition of progression-free survival is really a, a term we use as a, as a research tool. Uh, when we do our trials, we say, how long does a patient survive before they progress and there's certain criteria for progression. So I don't, I don't really use that, that term when I'm sitting in front of a patient. Um, you know, I think, I think progression differs depending on, on who you're speaking to. 
Uh, and and so 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 really, you've got to look at how patients are progressing before you decide to administer another therapy, or or, be, or before you decide a therapy is a failure. Uh, so so it's all really individualized. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Hennifar. Um, there's a question about if metastases metastasize. Um, and if so, why is there a focus on finding the primary? And I know you gave a great um, presentation about finding the primary. Yeah, thank you. So I, finding the primary can be very important for a number of reasons. But I think the most important one is to help direct the best optimal therapy. Oftentimes, a patient, when they have metastases and the primary is unfound, they could develop something later on from the primary, like a bile obstruction or other issues. So I, I do think it's worthwhile to identify the primary and to speak with your net team about whether or not it makes sense to remove the primary. Because as many of the people on this panel have recently presented, removing the primary lesion can improve outcomes. Great. Thank you for that. And Dr. Hennefar, there's another question about can primary nets be in the liver? That's a tough one. I would say almost never. There could be very rare cases where it's a primary liver. And I think that the, the words I would use would be very complicated and confusing, but it's very, very rare. So I think before you could say that, you would have to do all of the testing, including a colonoscopy, an endoscopy, a gallium 68, next gen sequencing, um, Every single test possible uh, needs to be done before you consider it a primary. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Ramirez, I'm wondering, can you ever achieve remission with a net diagnosis? I think, uh, I think remission uh, certainly is achievable, especially with, with some of the early stage tumors. Uh, um, these things that, that you can have what we call no evidence of disease. And certainly if you come to our office, you get a, you get a t-shirt that says any, I'm NED if, if that's the, uh, if that's the case. Um, you know, but, but again, it's, it's one of these things where, where surveillance is really, really key. Uh, and it's, you know, you, you, you know, it's, I, again, I want to reiterate, you know, I see patients all too often where, where they were told they had a benign tumor and, and go live your life and we don't need to do anything anymore. And then they come back with, uh, with, with a liver full of disease and, and which could have been prevented. So, mm -hmm. so uh, it's possible, uh, but surveillance is, is uh, always recommended. Well said, surveillance is key. Um, and we're gonna move on to somatostatin analog since that's very popular. Dr. Lee, um, there's questions about why one would, what a person would choose um, a physician would choose one as a somatostatin analog, like octreotide over lamreotide, or vice versa. I think, yeah, th this question comes up a lot, and I think you know the the general consensus uh, in the field is that the somatostatin analogs are essentially equivalent. Um, I think how you choose one over the other is that in some patients, for whatever reason, um, they'll have different you know, side effects or how they feel to one injection or the other. Um, so patient preference based off of you know, how they're feeling from the injection can matter and can influence your decision one way or the other. Um, and then secondly, I would say the other important uh, decision in terms of you know, which one to get would be where are you gonna get the injections? If you're getting the injections, I would say in a place where they don't do a lot of injections, uh, then potentially uh, my bias uh, for this would be to consider uh, something like lamreotide, uh, just because I think you don't have to go as deeper. It's a deep sub-Q injection, so you don't have to necessarily go all the way into the muscle like long-acting octreotide does, which is a deep uh, intramuscular injection. So it has potentially a less chance of not getting uh, of actually getting the correct dose uh, with the injection. So I would say in an area where they're not familiar uh, with the injections, that might be something to consider so that you get a, as much of a chance of getting a good injection as possible. But otherwise, in, in most places where we do a lot of injections and everyone is familiar with it, I would say it's essentially equivalent. Thank you for that. And Dr. Lee, if um, 
someone is on a long acting spinosad analog and having hip joint aches, could that possibly be from the spinosad analog? Um, I, I mean, usually that, that, that hasn't been, you know, uh, a major side effect that's, uh, you know, been described. But again, uh, I think the context will be, you know, uh, how are they doing the injections? Uh, are they uh, doing it in, at, at the correct location and whatnot and everything? Is there any other things that might be causing that? Okay. Um, Dr. Hennefar, um, I know we've been sheltering in place for a while in Los Angeles, and some patients might have skipped one or more Savannah analog injection. Um, would this op possibly open up um, injections to every two months instead of every one month? How would you go about doing this? Yeah, this is a very interesting question and something that we've been dealing with right now in the clinic because of the COVID situation. In general, it's okay to skip a dose. Um, doing it every other month was not something that would be recommended. I think as the lockdown is improving, the infection rate seems to be improving as well. The hospital is allowing more visitors, more procedures to be done. It seems like we're going in the right direction and we can resume normal therapy either currently or fairly soon. Thank you for that, Dr. Hendefar. Um, Dr. Lee, there's a question about a new, um, new medication, um, as you know, Benfizia. So we're wondering if doctor, doctors have heard of it and if they are having difficulty prescribing it. If you could also explain oh, what it is. Sure, so uh, Benfizia is um, essentially a, uh, a short-acting octreotide pen um, so traditionally for patients uh, that have carcinoid syndrome, uh, in addition to the long-acting somastan analogs, they might need short-acting relief. So they, they've been injecting themselves with short-acting octreotide. Um, so what Benfezia is, is, it's essentially like a pen that has a stored about uh, 7,000 uh, micrograms of um, uh, short-acting octreotide. Um, and what's What's nice about it is that you essentially carry it around like an allergy pen in a way. Uh, it doesn't require refrigeration. Uh, and there's uh, kind of own uh, pre-filled uh, dosing. So like uh, at 50 intervals all the way up to 200. So then you can kind of set it just like what you would do with, you know, uh, insulin injections and whatnot uh, so that you can self-administer it to yourself re with relatively uh, good ease. Um, I don't think a lot of people know about this uh, because traditionally we've been just using short-acting uh, octreotide uh, injections, but um, it'll be interesting to see how patients feel about it that have been using short-acting octreotide with this kind of pre-filled pen uh, where it's relatively easy for them to administer. So I, I think, you know, it's going to take time to see what the patient feedback is ultimately. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Handafar, this question that comes up about um, if there's any help for seniors or Medicare who have limited funds um, to get the long-acting somatostatin analog injections. Uh, you're on mute still, sorry. Generally speaking, there are patient assistance programs available through manufacturers for people or patients who can't, who have trouble affording the, the certain medications that they're on. And what I would recommend is if you have a, a big copay or something that's not quite working out with the insurance that you investigate those, either through the pharmacy or through your net team, this is something that we're quite experienced helping patients with. So definitely ask for help. I always implore my patients, don't just give them the credit card and take a big, you know, a big bill, look into it a little bit more, ask us if you need some help and, and we'll do the best we can to, to get you the assistance you need. And I know we have those links on our LACNETS resource page as well. Oh, fantastic, uh, yeah. So go to the LACNETS um, page, that'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Dr. Ramirez, there's, a, I mean, speaking of other treatments, right? We have more than smatistan analogs. One question, one question that came up, is it, is it possible, Dr. Ramirez, to recover from a serious case of pneumonitis when taking a Finitor? And if so, are there any tips beyond oxygen, prednisone, inhalers, nebulizers? So yeah, so uh, so patients on Everolimus or Finitor are, are, do have a, a risk of development of uh, pneumonitis. It's, it's uncommon, but we certainly see it from time to time. And, uh, and depending on how severe it is, it, it really depends on, are we able to re-challenge that patient with uh, Everolimus or not? If it's severe, certainly not. Um, 
so so can you recover from it? Yes. Um, you know, I've had patients on this and 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 gotten to a point where they've they've needed to go on breathing machines because it was that severe. Obviously, that's the patient I'm never putting back on this. Um, but but generally speaking, the the treatment is is those high dose corticosteroids for a period of time until things calm down. Oxygen is is important with this. So those are the mainstays of treatment. Okay. Um, I'm going to just get to my last two questions. Um, one question for you, Dr. Hendafar. Um, if someone has had captem therapy for, say, two years for peanuts, um, was stable, would it be conceivable then to restart captem with progression? Uh, that would be conceivable. A little bit concerning to be on Temodar for that uh, period of time. So I would definitely consult with your, your, your physician to figure out whether or not it makes sense in your particular case to go back to the Temodar. And if it does, you should definitely do that. It's very common to rechallenge therapies that have been previously been effective if you didn't stop them because they became ineffective. Okay. And the last question is also for you, Dr. Hendafar. Um, there were several questions about alternative modalities, as you know, um, and I kind of grouped them into one question. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any alternative modalities that have been proven to be effective, um, such as acupuncture, reflexology, hyperthermia, um, Edgar Kais devices, IV vitamin C, herbal or essential oils? It's a, it's a great question and something very relevant to our patients who are dealing with the chronic disease and looking to, you know, to take advantage of every opportunity they have to get better. So in general, we recommend patients, you know, be as well as possible, focus on wellness, you know, exercise, eat well, you know, organic foods are great, you know, avoiding things that are unhealthy. And, and also concentrate on wellness. Now, if a patient would like to try alternative therapies, we're totally supportive of that, but number one is safety. So if you know the therapy is safe, definitely do it. I mean, traditional Chinese medicine, especially acupuncture is incredibly safe. When you get to the herbs then, and you're taking chemo, it gets a little bit more complicated. So remember, focus on safety. Supplements also become a little bit concerning because there might be interactions with the treatments that you're on, and many of them don't have a proven benefit. But things like reflexology, that's fantastic. Massage therapy, you know, go for that. Anything that you know is safe. Hyperthermia, that's when I start to get a little bit nervous. That's a little bit borderline. But most of the therapies you've mentioned shouldn't be a problem at all. And many of these therapies have, you know, thousands of years of tradition that we should be respectful of. Hmm. Massages and acupuncture sound great. Yes, <laughs> Thank, <they do>. you. <laughs> Thank you for um, all of you, Dr. Ganji, Dr. Ramirez, Dr. Hendafar, and Dr. Lee for your time. I'm going to hand it off to Josh Mailman, who will um, moderate with the remaining four panelists. And hopefully the remaining four panelists can turn on their cameras if, um, if they could. And, uh, we welcome um, we say goodbye to everyone um, and hello to a whole new group of people. So thank you for joining us. Um, while I get uh, changed my screen a little bit, I just wanted to ask um, Dr. Metz one quick question, if I may. Um, during this time of, of uh, while we've been sheltering in place, um, what's gone on in the research community? How has this impacted the research community? Uh, good question. I mean, it's been very difficult, obviously, to continue doing research during this time. Uh, we've closed our university uh, just before the spring break, and it hasn't opened yet. Uh, and as a consequence, when you close down a lab, it's a big deal to get things reopened again. And when you're doing that a thousand people strong, it's a real problem. So we've just slowly started reintroducing our, our research operations, uh, but it's been difficult. And, you know, you think of all the uh, research animals, all the technicians, all the supplies. So it's taking a long time to get these things up and running again. What is going well at our institution and many others is a rapid turnover to doing COVID research. And so they, I believe we have about 40, 50 protocols at our institution doing COVID studies. And many of our research people during the surge were pulled over to those sort of studies that are, are still still ongoing. Uh, but people are obviously working very hard to continue. And uh, I think that uh, with the upcoming resurgences, this will uh, improve. I think it's going to be definitely um, geographically dependent. Uh, you know, I'm on the East Coast here, uh, and our uh, caseload is declining. We're starting to open up the hospitals. We're doing more procedures again. 
but on the other hand, there are many states, uh, especially on the West Coast, where things are slowly increasing. So I'm not sure how this is all going to pan out. And I uh, am a firm believer in uh, physically distancing. Uh, the term social distancing doesn't work for me. I'd like to be socially closer, but physically distant. Uh, and I think we need to see how those things go. So research has taken a hit, uh, but I think it's going to be coming back. On the positive um, side, Josh, we were, we were, although the research lab shut down, we were able to keep all our net clinical trials open. So RETNAD, CAPTEN Y90, we're still accruing patients on our research clinical trials, even though we're doing the, uh, the coordinators are all working from home. So at least that we were able to sustain. That's fantastic. Um, Dr. Yu, there was a question that came in um, regarding, do we really, do we have any idea of what cause, causes NETs? And, and I know that um, may be different for different types of NETs. So can you kind of fill us in there? Sure, it's a great question. Uh, for most uh, NETs, uh, the cause is not very clear. Uh, but for some people with uh, NETs, we do know uh, the uh, you know more definitively what causes their NETs. Uh, uh, for people with genetic syndromes, uh, the, uh, the genetic mutation in the patient, uh, usually inherited, uh, uh, do cause uh, uh, Various uh, nets, and uh, there are actually about uh, uh, way over uh, ten uh, uh, genetic diseases that can cause uh, 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 nets. Um, so, but the overall, uh, only about five to ten percent of uh, patients with nets are caused by genetic causes, and uh, rarely environmental causes um, uh, are possible. For example, in a very rare uh, skin neuroendocrine cancer called uh, Merkel cell carcinoma, there's a virus that can cause it. Uh, sometimes other chronic diseases in the lungs or in the GI tract, uh, for example, uh, you know, you have uh, any cr uh, chronic lung allergy or uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, you can have a small NET uh, micro uh, uh, tumors uh, form. But whether they progress to growth tumor, we do not know. Um, Dr. Mitra, um, Dr. Mitra, sorry about that. I, I know we talked to uh, lung nets and, um, and then we were also talking PRT and, and kind of the combination question there is I know that there's a trial coming up on PRT and lung nets and what will it take to make this um, something that becomes more of a standard of practice and do you think this will go to, a, to try to an approval or how do, we, how do we go forward with this in uh, lung nets and PRT? Yeah, thanks, Josh. Yeah, this is a question that definitely comes up because the approval for PRRT, as most uh, people probably know, is only for gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So for lung and other types of neuroendocrine tumor patients who, firstly, they do have to show uh, uptake on a gallium dotate PET scan. But if they do, then the question becomes, uh, would they be eligible for this treatment? I think that ultimately the, the answer is does by things that we do, that's really going to be the way to prove that this is something that's uh, efficacious for those people. But I will also say that um, in our experience, and I think probably many of the others on this call, they um, would say that if we're already treating some patients who don't have other great options and, and again, show high uptake of somatostatin receptors on imaging with PRT already. It's something that um, needs to be pre-approved with the insurance. Uh, but if it's done, then uh, it can already be potentially available to you now. But the but the real way would be through clinical trials. That's great, and and I know um, both Dr. Mitra and Dr. Sulin, you, you work a lot in imaging. One of the things that we've seen a lot of um, patients who have um, allergic reactions to uh, imaging agents or imaging contrast. Um, what do you do with um, patients who have a, an allergy to an iodine contrast or, or things of that nature? Dr. Sulin, for, uh, why don't you give a, that a go? Well, so if someone's had a reaction, say you drink a CAT scan or some such, um, there's a very standard prep that uh, is, you know, varies a little bit from hospital to hospital, but essentially involves taking steroids starting 12 hours ahead of time. Uh, and then again, the morning of the procedure, uh, often we'll also give some Benadryl beforehand. Um, but every hospital will have its own protocol. So if you've had an adverse reaction, uh, like itching or hives um, uh, or shortness of breath or throat swelling after getting IV contrast, just make sure the radiologist knows when you go in for the next test um, by ahead of time. So that you can, because you need to start your steroid prep 12 the day before, 12 hours ahead. Um, 
Dr. Mitra, I know you talked about um, FTG and um, Gallium 68 in your, um, in your presentation. And one of the questions, um, there's a lot of questions on imaging. Um, one that I'll, we can address quickly is, can um, an FTG and Gallium 68 be done at the same time? Um, do they have to be on different days or is there some sequencing that can be done for patients where this is indicated? Yeah. So the answer is that no, they can't be done at the same time. And the reason for that is because it's using the same isotope. Uh, and so the scanner actually can't tell the difference between FDG and uh, dotatate because uh, it looks the same to the, to the scanner, which I know can sound a little bit confusing. But the, um, the end result is that we have to do them sequ sequentially. And uh, the gallium dotatate has a much shorter half-life. So the, if, if both of them need to be done, uh, the way to, best way to do it would be to do gallium dotatate first, followed by FTG probably the, the next day. Um, that's great. And, and thank you for, for doing that. There's a lot of questions on um, image timing, scanning timing. When do you read this um, in, in the world of certainly PRT? Uh, what is, you touched a little bit upon um, the, the use of uh, scanning post-PRT, but in a, the long-term follow-up, whether um, Dr. Metz, you would like to chime in on this as well, what do we know about when's the right time to image and what image modality should we, should we choose and, and are we still learning about this? Eric, do you want to go first? Um, sure. My answer would be that we are definitely still learning about it. Uh, of course, we use Dotatate pad and sometimes FTG pad for selection of patients for PRT, but uh, standard anatomical imaging still has a very important role in terms of looking at progression and in terms of therapy response. That's still the standard of care as well is to, is to follow with a CT or MR scan. We're learning, uh, as many uh, places are in the world, about the use of gallium dotatate pad and FDG pad. Uh, so that's something I think that's evolving, but we typically do it about three to four months after the completion of all four cycles of the PRRT. And, and Dr. Metz, I'll open it up a little wider for you. We are often asked that question of um, what, how often should patients be scanned and how often are they tracked? And I know this is really much like we're all individualized. This is really an individualized thing. And I can see Dr. Yu also shaking his head at the same time. Um, maybe the two of you want to talk about how you, um, how you follow your patients with imaging. Right. So they're very good questions, Josh. Uh, you know, traditionally, I think people considered carcinoids and, and neuroendocrine tumors as being a malignancy that needed follow-up like any other standard solid tumor. And I think we over-investigated and over-tested everybody for the first five years. And then we turned around to them five years later and said, oh, you're cured, go and have a good time. I think other surgeons actually felt that carcinoids were so slow growing that if they thought they got it all the first time around, they said, go and have a good life and never come back again. Which makes me actually think of you know people who say, did you ever have a, 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 an appendectomy many years ago? There could have been a primary we never knew about, for example. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we don't want to overtest people by any means. So uh, I think this was a very important uh, a consensus conference that we had some time back uh, between NANETS, North American European Tumor Society, and the ComNETS group, which is from Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And we have a, uh, a consensus, which is really a discussion on what we think is best. The data ain't really there, but we tend to over-investigate early and under-investigate late. And so I think based on what you think is the residual tumor burden after the first intervention, whether it is surgery or oncologic intervention or liver-directed therapy, I think you have to decide what is this particular patient's risk and how often am I going to be following them uh, I tend to like MRIs for the liver to follow. I think it helps. It's easier to see. Although a triple phase CT scan is very useful, shows lymph nodes, and as Michael and sure will say, it makes him know exactly where the vessels are that he's going to be puncturing and, and, and uh, dealing with in his therapy. Uh, functional imaging, as you know, is very controversial. It's expensive, but I do believe it's very useful. I think I may personally over, overdo the functional imaging. Uh, I see Michael raising his hand there. Every tumor board, I'm ordering functional imaging. 
I like to get the best image of what I can know, but I don't want to do it too often. I think getting a gallium scan any more than once a year is really overkill. Uh, I also think that there's no value in using gallium specifically to monitor unless you know that everything else doesn't show the tumors well enough. Uh, but I think ultimately, as you said, it comes down to uh, discussions with the patient and learning how we go. Uh, I think both cross-sectional imaging and functional imaging are important. And I think we need to modify our approach by deciding why we're doing the test to know what we're looking for and only do them if you know it's going to make an impact if you find something that you potentially think is a concern. Uh, but we're learning as we're going ahead. Do you, you, did you want to chime in here as yeah. well? Okay, sure. So I agree with uh, Dr. Mass, uh, first of all. And uh, so we really should tailor our imaging modality, meaning whether it's a functional imaging or anatomic imaging, based on the patient and the patient's disease, and also based on the purpose of the imaging. Uh, so, for example, for a patient with a uh, very aggressive, uh, you know, uh, a grade three neurodegenerative carcinoma, uh, they should they probably be followed more uh, closely. But for a patient with, uh, you know, most common uh, grade one or grade two neurodegenerative tumor, um, the imaging frequency, I think, is uh, in most centers is just uh, too close. I think we should uh, widen the, the, the gap, but uh, not decrease the, the number of imaging. And for also patients with genetic syndromes, uh, you know, maybe they do not have a tumor yet. We need to do a tumor surveillance uh, or um, as a preventive measure. Uh, imaging every two to three years is totally appropriate. So it really should really be boiled down to the specific patient and the disease the patient has. Dr. Sulin, I was actually really interested in your presentation when you talked about the studies that you did on drug-eluting beads and that they clearly should, you know, fall out of the um, guidelines. How, how long will it take to, to make sure that all centers aren't really um, doing this and has moved, um, moved forward in what they're, what they're doing and not including drug-eluting beads for NETS patients? And, and how do we disseminate that? That's a really, really good question, Josh. And this is a place where patients can really be strong advocates for themselves. You know, the drug eluding bead platform for doing chemo mobilization came into existence around 2010, uh, replacing the uh, older technique using an oily emulsion. And uh, it really took over more than half the market in the US and in Western Europe. So it's very, very commonly done. In fact, for the younger practitioners, it may be the only way they've ever done chemo mobilization. They didn't learn sort of the old fashioned way. Um, but there were some very large retrospective studies from Europe that raised the alarm that this particular technique for doing chemo mobilization was associated with a high rate of liver and biliary injury, uh, not just in NETs, but particularly in NET patients. And then there were two trials um, my own and another trial, it was just a single arm study out of Johns Hopkins, both of which showed a dramatically higher rate of significant bile duct and liver injury from drug eluting beads. Uh, in fact, both those study arms were closed in less than 20 patients. Uh, so uh, this is going to change the guidelines. So the NCCN guidelines will change as of 2020 to specifically say you should not use this technique in neuroendocrine patients. Um, but how, if, I think it'll be a while before the message gets out, uh, especially into the community. So if, you know, chemobilization is still a great technique. I do a lot of it. I do it the old fashioned way. Uh, and if you're a patient who's going to go chemobilization, you want to talk to the interventional oncologist who's treating you and make sure that they're not using drug eluting beads. Um, and I think, because I think it's going to be a little bit of time as Josh rightly questioned before this sort of new knowledge really penetrates the community. So um, thank you so much for that. And I, and I think uh, it's up to us, uh, the patient groups, of course, to disseminate this to their groups as well so that uh, patients that don't fall under this, as, uh, as you stated. Um, Dr. Metz, uh, have a question on Zermela, but I, I wanted to open it up a little bit as well. Um, you know, this is mitigating symptoms, um, Zermela for diarrhea, but even looking at PRT and and does it control symptoms? And you know, how do how do we mitigate all these symptoms that are happening? And and do some of these drugs um, do more than just what you think they're going to do? And and can they help with with symptom control in other ways that we may not know? 
Yeah, well, good question, Josh. Uh, and I think the best example of that is the somatostatin analogs because they were really originally felt to be very helpful for slowing product and therefore removing syndromes. Uh, but then along came Promid and Clarinet and the subsequent studies that showed actually if you block the somatostatin receptor, not only do you switch off tumor products and syndromic effects, it you also retard tumor progression. And of course, that is extended further with the whole Theranostics idea to imaging and also to PRRT, which is a treatment using that approach. Um, Zomelo is a drug you particularly mentioned, which is a tryptophan hydroxylase inhibitor and is used specifically in the carcinoid syndrome because it blocks the production of serotonin. And from a symptomatic perspective, it has been shown to improve specifically diarrhea, for which it's utilized in stable patients. Uh, does it have any other effects? I think, let's say, at this point, being evaluated. Uh, it, similarly, other syndromic effects, like the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, instead of using an SSA to switch off gastrin production, if you use a proton pump inhibitor, you hit the final common path of the activity of that uh, gastrin, which drives acid secretion. So all the syndromic effects of ZE will go away if you have an appropriate suppression of your acid with a proton pump inhibitor. And there are other drugs that are being studied for those indications now as well. Um, other than those two major ones for syndromic management, there are various therapies that have not really been specific, but may have helped. Uh, but I do firmly believe that if the syndrome is out of control because the bulk cannot be managed medically, that there are surgical approaches. And when I say surgical approaches, I mean surgery, open the patient and remove tumor. But uh, I think with uh, Michael and Eric on the line here, uh, they need to be uh, recognized for giving um, liver-directed therapeutic approaches that are very useful for patients who are out of control with syndrome on occasions. Um, I do also, also mention, since you bring it up, the ACTHOMA in terms of products, uh, and I see Ron no uh, nodding his head there. I mean, uh, ectopic release of ACTH is a very uh, debilitating, massively debilitating disease and can be very rapidly uh, severe, uh, have a severe outcome with perforation, for example. And there are, in my personal opinion, no good medications for that. Although people use metyrapone, orthopara, DDD, and other medications, it's really a surgical treatment, in my opinion. Very different from non-ectopic ACTH production. Um, but, uh, you know, there are many, many drugs that are employed to switch off syndrome. Now, on the other hand, from syndromic effects, diarrhea specifically, obviously, there are many medications get, that can modify motility and change uh, um, release of enzymes and that sort of approach, which I listed in my discussions, that are also important for syndrome effects, but are not going to necessarily affect all of them. I think the beauty of an SSA, however it is delivered, is that it is really a global uh, inhibitor. So it shouldn't really be called som somatostatin because it was grown out of somatotropes in the, in the brain, in the pituitary. It probably should be called something like ubiquitin, but unfortunately, ubiquitin was taken already, so we stuck with somatostatin. Um, the, uh, the, thank you for that, that answer. Um, Dr. Mitra, one of the questions that comes up a lot for patients that have PRT and trying to figure out how to, where to find it and put it up on the screen, but um, one of them is, you know, patients have a, a decrease in platelets and other, um, uh, other things that can happen. There's always this question of what can they do, what can they take that might increase their platelets back up, or is there any of these things that can be done um, to help mitigate some of the effects of um, PRT, or is this something that the body does just to recover over the long, uh, uh, over the long term? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so uh, to start with, I think it's a good reminder that the main toxicity that we're all seeing from PRRT is related to platelets even more than um, other types of hematologic toxicity or bone marrow toxicity. Um, and then with regard to um, this type of toxicity, this is exactly why, uh, just so everyone knows, why we space out the different cycles of the therapy every two months or sometimes even a little bit longer to give the body time to recover. Uh, I would say that 
um, that is a question that we often get in terms of what what patients can do. And unfortunately, there really, really is nothing. Your body just has to kind of recover on its own. Even more than that, there are medical approaches to help the platelets recover, uh, for instance, with a platelet transfusion or other agents. And uh, we actually don't recommend that because we want to see that your own bone marrow can recover normally. Um, and so then it can tolerate the next cycle of the therapy. If it doesn't recover, then again, we can do, uh, extend the duration until the next cycle, or uh, unfortunately, it's not the right treatment for you. Uh, thank you um, very much for that. Um, sorry, I just pulled up the wrong question. I'll, one last question that I want to talk to you about, um, actually, Dr. Metz and Dr. Yu, um, there's this, uh, does NETS cause diabetes? And I know that um, that may be different depending where your primary was. And then um, many of us are on SSAs and does that increase the um, potential to have diabetes? And if we go off of these drugs, does that um, take away the, uh, the, the diabetic effect that, that may have occurred? And that's the question I'm gonna close from. So um, why don't both of you Feel free to take any part of that, that question, and, um, and thank you very much. Yeah. Ron, do you want to go ahead? Okay, sure. Uh, so be, as a, because I'm an endocrinologist, so, uh, uh, so very rarely uh, NET can directly cause diabetes. Uh, uh, usually this is because a hormone is produced from the NET, such as glucagon, somatostatin, and as Dr. Matt mentioned earlier, ACTH. Other than the three, uh, NETs usually do not directly cause diabetes themselves. But if you have a pancreatic uh, NET, uh, the if the tumor grows uh, and occupy uh, um, most of the pancreas, that itself can cause a problem of the normal pancreatic endocrine function. So, so in a way, uh, a, a big NET burden in the pancreas uh, can cause uh, uh, diabetes. But uh, most commonly, uh, the, uh, the uh, effect of uh, uh, on the blood sugar control by the NET is actually indirectly through uh, treatment. Maybe Dr. Matthew can elaborate on that, such as uh, SSA and others. Right. Well, yeah, so I would agree with uh, that. I, I would also say that uh, one disease we, we don't talk about too much in the neuroendocrine world that we probably should do uh, is the, the multiple type 1 gastric carcinoids, and that's autoimmune gastropathy or autoimmune metaplastic gastritis, and that disease is predisposed to achlorhydria, absence of acid, high gastrin levels, and it's an autoimmune condition. Why I'm saying that is that Autoimmune diseases tend to go together, and so you can see autoimmune gastritis and carcinoids of the stomach in patients who have type 2 diabetes because it's autoimmune-induced diabetes, or type 1, I believe. So diabetes is another association. The, so the, the diabetes that is a consequence of SSAs drying up the pancreas, well, it dries up the endocrine pancreas as well as the exocrine pancreas, and so you essentially become insulinopenic uh, as a consequence of suppression. So you can induce that condition. Uh, funnily enough, somatostatinomas are the reverse. Uh, and then sometimes if you put a somatostatin analog on board with a somatostatinoma patient, you can end up with diabetes, which is another kind of weird sort of situation. Of course, if you've had a pancreatectomy of any kind, or uh, if you've had pancreatitis as a consequence of surgeries and you've got gallstone pancreatitis, which can come from SSAs, uh, in that situation, you have to find diabetes. I think diabetes is extremely common. It's an epidemic anyway in the world. And um, Dan from uh, City of Hope obviously knows a lot about that sort of basic research there. Uh, the problem, of course, is that when you get diabetes and a neuroendocrine tumor and you put surgery and somatostatin analogs on top of it, you end up with a real difficult to control situation. And let me end by saying neuroendocrinology is a team sport. We all have to work together on this. We have to look about all of these, these things. And the worst thing that I see happen is when we take somebody who, through all of our uh, expertise together, we fix the neuroendocrine problem and the hemoglobin A1C is running around seven, eight, nine, and you know that they're gonna end up with a heart attack or kidney failure or something related to their diabetes. Uh, so we wanna keep everybody going as long as we can together chronically, but then we have to realize that this other stuff creeps in as well, because just like anybody else, we can potentially get these 
complications, which can be a problem. So I want to thank um, this panel for the, for all their help here in, in answering the questions. We had over 65, 70 questions that were um, asked in, in during this conference, and it was impossible to get to all of them. Um, we will try to get to many in FAQs coming up with LACnets. Um, but thank you again um, if you're for all of those who asked questions and sorry if we didn't get to all of your questions. And with that, I would like to um, turn it back over to the studio and there's our dancing zebra going through the screen. I'd like to turn it back over to the studio and, um, and Lisa and, uh, and our producers. We want to thank all our presenters today, the patients and physicians who took the time to share from their wisdom so we could learn from them. To recap our day, we started off this morning with Cindy Lovelace, the co-founder and executive director of the Healing Net Foundation, who named and described the common questions we have when first diagnosed with neuroendocrine cancer. We're reminded it's best not to Google the word neuroendocrine and instead find information specific to neuroendocrine cancer, or NET, through net-specific resources like the ones Cindy mentioned. We've learned how to go about finding net specialists through the vetted websites like carcinoid.org or the Net Research Foundations or LACNETs. We've learned about specific questions we might ask to establish trust, build confidence, and assess if this is a net expert we feel is willing to listen. Trust and communication are key. We've also heard several speakers remind us the importance of tumor grade and that everyone should know their tumor grade. So today might be a good opportunity to look that up and write that down on your Net Vitals communication tool or to make a note to ask your physician. When making treatment decisions, it's important to remember that tumors are heterogeneous, that multidisciplinary care is incredibly valuable, and most of all, each patient has different treatment preferences. So it's helpful to have a good relationship with your Net team so you can have an open and honest dialogue with them. The future is bright. There are several treatment options from surgery to somatostatin analogs, chemotherapy, target agents, PRT, liver directed therapy, and more treatments like other targeted therapies, immunotherapy, and advances in PRT on the horizon. While we focus quite a bit of attention on treating the disease, quality, quality of life is important. And that means managing symptoms such as diarrhea, hyperglycemia, and also diabetes. Today, we've been inspired by the stories from several NET patients, Cindy, Eric, Mary, Brent, Shawnee, and her daughter, Heather. We hope that you leave today encouraged, knowing that you are not alone, that we are a community. Today, you have heard from many other patients, physicians, and advocates who are living through this too. There are many experts and advocates fighting on your behalf. We are fighting with and for you. You are the reason we do all of this. And we strive to build connection. Connection can be encouraging, inspiring, and connection reminds us that we are alive. And we, when we come together and link arms, we are stronger together. LACNIS is a community with many resources available to you. Check them out on our website, including our NetVitals communication tool, blogs, quizzes, and much more. LACNETS is also more than a community. We are a family, and we invite you to join our monthly education meetings to con continue learning from our NET experts. We have an incredible lineup of speakers for the rest of the year that includes Dr. Eric Liu on Friday, July 24th, the LACNETS health coaches in August, Dr. Ed Wolin in September, and many more. We invite you to make connections and lean on each other for support in our weekly support group meetings. Caregivers are invited for a special monthly meeting designed especially for net caregivers and facilitated by local palliative care physician, Dr. Banerjee from City of Hope and her colleagues. Feel free to reach out to us anytime with questions or concerns you might have. We'd also like to thank our presenting sponsors today, Ipsin Pharmaceuticals and Sun Pharma. Other sponsors for today's conference were AAA, Advanced Accelerator Applications, as well as Lexicon. So huge thank you for making today possible. 
And last but not least, least, we'd like to thank Rich at TVP Live. He's the tech genius behind all of today. So huge thank you to you. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We hope to see you at a future meeting. Until then, stay safe and be well. Bye.